Hello, everybody, and welcome to our next Leadership Lessons, If I Knew Then, conversation uh, with Cece Morgan, the CEO of Headspace. Hey, Cece. Hey, Jason. I'm so happy to have you here today. I've really been looking forward to this. And, you know, I knew a little bit about your background and is so excited to go into it today. For those of you that are joining us again for maybe the 30th episode that we're doing, thank you for those of you just joining you. For those of you joining us for the first time, I'm Jason Nazar. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Comparably. We are an employee review platform and we help companies with their employer brand and recruitment marketing. We try to make workplaces more transparent and you can see amazing company cultures like the one here at Headspace. And this is a series that we do with incredible CEOs and leaders of primarily technology companies and fast, fast growing organizations and global organizations to be able to talk about the leadership lessons that they lived and that they experienced. And CC, you just have such an incredible background and Headspace is a company that's so meaningful and important to so many of us. And I think you're going to find that so many thousands of our listeners are already customers and users of your platform, you know, but in your own words, you know, how do you talk about Headspace and explain the business today? Oh, yeah, I'd be happy to do it. And thank you for the kind words, Jason. You know, if you think about it, we all have mental health. It's just a matter of where we are on the continuum at any given time in our lives, whether we're on the kind of mental health well-being and prevention or condition management, or maybe we've got a more chronic condition. But, you know, from a stat standpoint, 46% of us will have a diagnosable mental health condition in our lifetime, about a quarter of us every year. And so at Headspace, we are a mental health and wellness company, and we focus on helping people build healthy routines to care for their minds across this continuum that lasts a lifetime. So it's all about trying to develop these routines. And we do so by bridging this intersection of engaging content and experiences that are designed to be, you know, kind of draw you into the app, but it's all backed by science so that we can deliver highly uh, efficable solutions in the areas like stress, anxiety, depression, uh, and resilience. Yeah. I, I had the unique pleasure of knowing, you know, your founders, Rich and Sean, very early on, you know, were based in Los Angeles as they were. And I was just blown away by the product from day one. And, you know, I, you and I talked about this. I studied hypnotherapy when I was graduating uh, college and I was really fascinated about it and just the power of the mind. And I think part of what Headspace did is just made, you know, the practice of things like meditation and trance so easily acceptable, such a beautiful experience, you know, obviously just such an incredible narrator and founder and, and everything that you do there. Like when you first used Headspace, what was your reaction to that product? And like, what was that aha moment that you had? Huh, what a great question. The first time I used Headspace, I, I thought it was such a different approach from something that has been kind of mystical. And what I thought about Headspace is, I, I use the words, it's inviting and engaging, but in every session, you're being taught something. So it, it isn't just about coming in and doing breathing exercises. There was a lesson that was being taught, like maybe how to focus on appreciation or how to deal with financial stress or you know how to deal with the stress of kids at home during COVID. There was a topic and a, a teaching and the breathing was a part of how to deal with it, you know, because you know, sometimes people will ask me, what's the difference between mindfulness and meditation? And mindfulness is that state of being present and you're, you're, you're breathing and how you're thinking, whereas meditation is a means for getting to that mindfulness. And I was, I was taken by how, you know, the word simple comes to mind. It was just simple to digest. I don't know. How about for you? I think honestly, Andy, your founder and obviously the creator of the content and, you know, it, first off, I feel like I know him personally, although I've, he's one of the few folks in Headspace I haven't met and he would just made all everything so relatable, so easy. I mean, he's such a, a master 
of communicating principles that help you kind of connect with your own, you know, inner self and mind and to relax. He, he's what struck me really quickly and just really what a world-class teacher he was, you know, and I think obviously to build upon his background and experience is such a unique advantage. You know, Jason, he's like that all the time. So even if we're in a, you know, a board meeting or, you know, any kind of uh, discussion on the business, he has the same presence, uh, which I'm sure comes from 10 years practicing as a monk, but his presence is very consistent. What you hear in the app is exactly the way he is in person. And we'll find a way to get you introduced to him. Yeah. You know, I will say just to stay on this for a little while longer, and, and I don't make the time for this. Every really successful person I know swears by taking 20 minutes to an hour a day just for your own mindfulness and meditation. Now, if you got little kids, it probably feels impossible, right? But we all make time for the things that are most important for us, whether it's exercise or going out with friends or watching that TV show. And now obviously Headspace, you know, you can take that TV time and connect with that way. But had you, had you already been practicing meditation or what was your own background and experience with meditation before you joined Headspace? Yeah. So I had the fortune of having some people on my team at Intuit uh, who were meditation uh, instructors and, you know, really outside of work at Intuit dedicated their lives to that. So I was fortunate to have them uh, in my group. And so we did do some meditation sessions uh, when I was in, in the business unit, I was running at Intuit. Um, and so I had the ability to go through and have that experience but it hadn't become a habit for me in the same way it has uh, with Headspace. And part of the reason for that is the variety of content that Headspace offers. So, you know, when I go running, I can do an appreciation run. Um, so I'm focused on something when I'm running or, you know, mindful eating, or like I said, the, there's a variety of topics, relationship stress, anything, even when you're working and you're getting ready for a presentation, there is content that's specific for that. So I hadn't moved to where it was a part of so many different aspects of the day. And so now for me, um, it's multiple times throughout the day based on what my day is like. So, you know, I will have a session in the morning because that's the way to get the day started. I already told you I use it when I run. Um, we do mindfulness breaks at Headspace. So we will meditate together, but not for long periods of time. You know, we may do it just for five minutes before an all hands. And then, you know, we have time where we have no meetings during the day. I'll use that as another chance to meditate. And then of course, in the evening, whereas what I was doing before was one block of time. Now I do it, you know, throughout the day. So it's, again, it's a little bit more like a routine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I could spend this entire hour with you, Cece, just talking about the benefits and the different strategies and, you know, tricks around meditation. I'll say too, just on this topic. And first off, I mean, I would say most people that are probably going to be listening are probably already users of Headspace. If you all haven't, you have to become a customer because the content that you get access to is absolutely incredible. It's, it's so interesting to me, like, the, the, the thoughts that we, the thoughts that we tell ourselves, the self-talk that we give ourselves is really deterministic mm -hmm. of every emotion and feeling and behavior that we create over the years. And, you know, I'm sure you, you tell this to your team. And I, I say this phrase all the time, like you're never going to have a bigger life than you can imagine for yourself. The universe is never going to give you more than what you will imagine and believe that you can have yourself. And there's just so little of our day that we ever consciously spend giving ourselves suggestions, thought, giving ourselves quiet time so that we're not thinking and we let our mind be creative and go to positive places. And it's just such an important part of self-care that probably is still, you know, at the bottom of the list for so many people. And to me, I think the thing that, again, Headspace has done that's just so magical and is so important 
is that it's taken something that really has so many benefits for us physically, emotionally, psychologically, with our family, with our children, in our communities, and it's just raised to the forefront and it's made it easier to do that self-care that has so many other external benefits. And I just think it's such a special mission that you're part of. I mean, it's you've been a part of a lot of incredible companies, like to be part of Headspace and to be leading them now for the mission that you all are providing in the world is must feel really exceptional. Like you must feel really like just amazing about what you you and your team are doing every day. You know, it, it, for, first of all, I work with the most amazing people. People come to Headspace because they believe in the purpose of the company, which is to improve the health and happiness of the world. And I think the fact when they get there and the fact that they see that we practice what we do it because we believe in it, you know, starting all hands with things like meditation. Um, it is a, it is a very fulfilling feeling. Uh, to know that that's what you're trying to do. And Jason, if you could see some of the stories that we have about the impact that we've had or um, or even if they've gone on to even use apps besides ours, but just the fact that, we, that they've embraced meditation as a way to pause and be present. Um, the stories we get, especially this past year, I mean, they, they literally can bring a tear to your eye just to hear where someone was and the, you know, the incredible um, journey that they've been able to go through with their mind because they dealt with a really difficult situation. It is very fulfilling. And, yeah. and for me, I just feel lucky, very lucky to be a part of um, this organization, wonderful founders and people who literally come to the company because of the mission. Yeah, well, as I said before, Cece, they're lucky to have you and you've got this incredibly illustrious career. I I'd love to kind of start towards the beginning of it. And, you know, early on, like either as a kid or, or like, you know, as a teenager, did you have a really big vision for your life of what you wanted to accomplish? Like when you think about how you got into where you are today, like where did that all start? Wow, what a great question. And, and I'd love to say that I knew exactly what I wanted to do, but that's not the case. So uh, that wasn't me at all. Uh, and in fact, you know, one of the things that I think about when I'm, you know, I have a son, uh, a grown son. And so when I think about any advice uh, that I could give him that he might or might not follow, it would be to take time when you're first leaving home to discover yourself and discover what gives you passion and what really, really motivates you. And I'll, I'll come back to answering your question in a minute because it's the opposite of what I did. Um, but I, I think when you're, you're first coming out of school and you're in your twenties, there's no way you know yourself well enough or the impact you wanna have, at least most people, at least I didn't, the impact that you wanna have. And I think taking time at that age to get out and see the world, have some diverse experiences, engage with people that are different than you to kind of learn about the things that will give you passion is really important. And to come back to answering your question, I didn't know. I was a little bit more programmed on, you know, going to school and then, you know, starting a, a career in the, in the area that I had gone to school for. And it was after I started working that I started to realize you know, what is the work that gives me passion? What makes my heart beat faster every day? And that started to evolve me into different areas. And, and so I feel like if I would have taken some time before that, I might have uh, started some things in a little different area. What do you feel was the first big break in your career? Where do you feel like, okay, this put me on the path mm -hmm. to where I am today? You know, interesting. Um, uh, and for me, so many things are influenced by people that I learn from. Uh, very few ideas are my own, uh, but I'm very good at learning from others. So I grew up on the commercial commercialization side of the business. And um, this is goes a little bit back to uh, what my passion was, which I learned later, because I started out as a programmer. Um, and what I realized was I had more energy when I was actually out talking to people and engaging with people. And so I ended up shifting over to, like I said, the commercialization side of the business. So sales and marketing 
because I loved getting out there and hearing someone's problem and then trying to connect dots on how we might be able to solve their problem. And one of the best things that I learned uh, very early on from a mentor uh, was this concept of you can either be O focused, meaning other or self focused being self. Mm -hmm. And the closer you are on the continuum to focusing on other people, the more value you brought to the world and the more value you brought to others. And I still teach that every time I have a new group of people, I introduce them to that continuum because I think it's so incredibly powerful. That's I mean, obviously today there's such a focus on STEM and especially bringing more diversity into STEM, whether it's women or people of color, but that was a big deal for you to be on the engineering side when you were. And then it's also super rare for people to go from the engineering side into sales and marketing. You know, interestingly enough, we've had a couple of guests that followed that path, the CEO of Trinet, the CEO hmm. of Zoom, you know, obviously is this incredible sales leader today where he started off on the engineering side. What, what got you first interested on the, you know, more technical side of things? And then how did you find yourself gravitating towards sales and marketing? Yeah, so my father was an engineer. And so uh, that is what got me interested in the beginning to be uh, an engineer. And when I was doing some training, so when I first started my career, I was uh, doing uh, the programming for banking systems. And when uh, I was doing some training at a financial institution and somebody from another company was there and just literally said, you do a good job of standing up and simplifying uh, what you've just programmed so that the people mm -hmm. that are going to be running this actually understand how to do it. Have you ever considered doing that full time? And that's what caused me to say, no, but now that you bring it up, I love this part of my job. And so that's, that's how it happened for me. But, it, but interesting too, Jason, I had uh, in, in the business I was just running it into it, uh, the, the um, chief architect for me uh, came to me one day and did something similar and said, hey, I wanna be a CEO one day and I'd like to expand my horizons. I've always been uh, in the engineering side of the house and you, you, know, you promoted me to chief architect you know, I would like to go into a business development role and see what that's like for me. And I said, hey, I am all about mobility and cross training and people getting in uncomfortable positions, which was really uncomfortable for him. And he has thrived. You know, I think you bring up such an interesting point that I want to stay on for a moment, which is what you just self-identified as your strength all the way back then, which is simplifying a concept and being able to explain it. And if I were to think of what, if I were to try to actually say what Andy does so well, is, is that very, is that very thing. Mm -hmm. And, and to me, if you look at any masterfully successful CEO or salesperson or head of marketing, I think what they all do is they take pretty complex situations and can distill them really simply. I mean, that's the difference between someone who's a great individual contributor as an engineer versus someone who, that goes on to be a CTO. It's not the difference in the skill set; it's the difference in communication. And um, I feel like that's something that people often attribute to just you either have it or you don't, but that's often the X factor of why people get farther along in their career. And, and how do you think about coaching and mentoring people around that? And, and how has that served you in your career? Yeah, I, I love that question because um, first of all, I think most everything is something that you can learn if you have the, uh, you know, if you can set aside what you know to let new information in, I think this is one of those things that can be taught. And, um, you know, I usually, so I do a fair amount of coaching on this because I think storytelling is really important. One of the things that I note, and anyone on my team will tell you this, most people will come in to, let's take a board meeting as an example, because my team obviously comes with me for board updates. They will typically come in with too much information. Um, and, and then they won't have organized it into a concise set of say three topics. And so the first thing I will do with them is say, what are the three most important things that you want the board to know? Get rid of all this other noise that you've got in here and make sure that every piece of content 
that you're going to have in the pre-read and that you're going to speak to supports only these three points that you think are most important for them to know. And it, it, it's the same with when we do narratives, they come in and they're just really long. And so we'll work with the team to say, you've got to get down to, you know, no more than a couple of pages to get your point across. And it's, it's a little bit of assume they don't know anything mm -hmm. and get rid of all of the acronyms and literally tell a story that an eighth grader could understand and get rid of all the noise beyond that. But we, we focus on the power of three. I love that so much. I, I often like, you know, as I do different like angel investing uh, and people come to me with their business ideas uh, and my rule of thumb is exactly what you just said, which is if you can't explain your business idea to a 13 year old and it's simple enough that they could explain it back to a, another older person and, and that not too much is lost in the game of telephone, then it's probably too complex, either what you're doing or how you're explaining it. You know, you know who I found was just so masterful at that, which I know you're going to give me a bad, big head nod and smile was Brad Smith. I just never, Unbelievable. I had never met a better communicator in my life and someone that stayed so focused and on message. This is obviously the former CEO of Intuit that both you and I, you know, worked under for a little while, you much longer than me, but I just feel like I learned so much from him, even the year and a half that I was at Intuit, you know? He is the, um, by far, the best leader I have ever experienced. Yeah. What, as you think about, because it was about 12 years you spent it into it, right? Yeah, long time. You know, A, that's just so remarkable. It's so, it's so rare these days. And, and, and to me, that's the thing that is really exceptional about Intuit. I've never, I've never seen an organization that keeps people longer. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and what that means is that folks are having opportunities for professional development and growth. They're having a meaningful experience. Remember, this is the hottest job market ever in the history of the world over the last 15 years. People are trying to be poached left and right. And so it's just such an exceptional place overall. You know, as you think about, I'll ask you the same thing, as you think about the three big lessons that you learned from that tenure, right, which is four college students you did. <laughs> Three, three stints of college at Intuit. True. You did, you did high school, you did college, and you did grad school all there. As you think about the three most important things that, that you learned and the person that you became and, and, and how you lead at Headspace now, what were those Intuit lessons that, that you took away from that period of time? Yeah. Um, so I'll do this in the group of threes because I certainly learned group of threes from Brad. Um, one of them was hearts and minds and that, uh, you know, both matter. And, you know, if you just unpack that a little bit, it's uh, hearts being really caring about the people that you're working with and assuming good intent, always assuming good intent uh, is a really important way to lead. And the minds component of that is that you do have to have frameworks and processes that guide the organization um, so that you can do things at scale, but it's the intersection of hearts and minds. We refer to it also as the what and the how, with the how being uh, a bit of the minds or the bit of the hearts component. The second piece would be the innovation framework that is used at Intuit. And by the way, we've taught this uh, in multiple uh, venues external to Intuit, but it started with you know, find an important unsolved customer problem, which is literally what Scott Cook built the company on, but find that important problem, fall in love with the problem, and then experiment, uh, rapid, fast experiments to find the best possible solution to that problem, and then deliver a benefit to the customer um, that is measurable in a way that delights them. Uh, and if you do that, um, the odds of you having sustainable growth is really, really strong. Um, and then the third one is the um, learning mindset. Although this would be one of the ones that I would say has probably been one of the things that I might've also contributed to into it, but the power of curiosity and always learning. Um, you know, we, we would have leadership development sessions every year uh, always bringing in somebody from the outside to teach us new ways of doing things, or we would shadow leaders to literally go and absorb what they were doing. And so just that 
constant openness to there might be a new or better way than what I've always thought about. Um, anyway, those would be the three things that are top of mind for me. Yeah, I can definitely echo that. I remember when, um, even before the book, The Lean Startup came out, which really changed how so many large organizations thought about, you know, agile development and speed to release. Um, you know, the author had been a consultant at Intuit for a long time to come. And the, the series that you and I are doing right now, I used to do in person in Los Angeles, and we were fortunate enough to have Scott be a guest. And there's just so many organizations. Oh, yeah, to your second point, Cece, there's so many organizations that have now modeled what I think Intuit perfected, which is this idea of deep customer learning. He, you know, he would tell, he told the story, uh, and it sounds a little creepy today in the world, you know, in the, such a digital world, but of doing like the listening tours where you would actually go into a customer's home and they would watch how they used QuickBooks. They would just sit there and look and watch how they used, I think at the time it was Quicken, right? And, and just these deep, deep user feedback sessions, right? And so as you are, are now at the helm of like Headspace, like how do you think about applying those kinds of deep customer principles to the product development that you're doing today? You know, um, I, I love the fact that you and I have both had the same background because we can we can talk about some similar stories. And um, you know, Scott Cook is probably one of the best product coaches I've ever seen because he literally um, focuses so much on what did you observe and what surprised you when you did the follow me home to observe what people were doing. And so at Headspace, as you can imagine, we have launched our version of it. And in fact, we trained the entire company. It's got a, some tweaks to it based on the work that we do, but we launched it to the entire company uh, last October. Um, and while we can't go out right now into people's homes, um, we did do virtual follow me homes to see how people use the app and in what circumstances they use the app and how they felt about it. And you can still do that where you unpack from people, you know, how are you feeling now? And why did you choose this part of the app to do? Uh, and how did you feel after you used it? So we've done, we've leveraged that. And I love that you brought up the Lean Startup, which as you referenced was Eric Reese, because literally right before this call, uh, we had a deep dive with our executive team with some coaches from the Lean Startup because they've introduced some frameworks around experimentation that uh, I find really interesting. And so we had the team actually apply that framework to some experiments we're currently running uh, to help guide us and see if we would do some things differently. And in fact, it changed every single one of the experiments we were working on. There's a really interesting, I'm gonna send it, there's this really interesting, um, uh, it, it's, it's a tweet and it's, it's a great piece of content and um, it's a slide deck called Destined to Fail about product, mm -hmm. product development and product management. And I'm looking it up now as we're chatting. And what it basically talks about, and I think Intuit was so thoughtful at helping to overcome this. And you just said something, Cece, that just such, struck such a chord with me is there's a challenge in product development called the focusing illusion. It means whatever you talk to somebody about and whatever, whatever product you're presenting at that moment, it's the most important thing to you and to them. And so it seems like it raises to the top. It's like, why when somebody has a new business idea and they say, Hey, do you think this is a good idea? So many people often give good feedback. It's not just because they don't want to be critical. It's because at that moment, it's the most important thing to them. And what folks often talk about is, um, doing customer problem stack ranking. So just asking your customer, what are the three most important things you're trying to solve for in rank order? And if what you put in front of them isn't, you know, ideally number one, but certainly if it's not number two or three, you might be, you know, the victim of this focusing illusion, right? And to me, I think what Headspace just got so right is it just nailed product market fit so clearly so early on. It just was such an emotionally resonating product with people the second they saw it. Like you just watched that first video and it just completely had you hooked. 
And so now as you think about doing more product development and going into the enterprise and having more avenues for your content, like it's Netflix, like how do you think about helping to lead that same kind of discipline around product market fit where you're really getting to the core problems that people most care about? Yeah, there, there, yeah, there's probably a couple different things in there. Let me let me start with the core product itself, Jason, because whether we're offering it through a direct to consumer model or through a healthcare provider, which also they refer people to us, or whether it's through the employer, the the offering and the methodology is still the same. So it, it these are just different channels. And where we are focused right now is starting to apply things like AI and ML to predict what is the next best um, session for you. And, you know, we, we're, we're doing that now by getting uh, perceived stress scores, things like that within the app. So we've now started to capture that and, and because we have millions of users, we can learn from all of that data. And it, since our goal is to get you to the benefit you came to us for as fast as possible, whether it's stress reduction, anxiety reduction, being more resilient, we want to make sure that what we're giving you is the, the best possible pathway. And yours and mine might be slightly different. Um, but things like machine learning now allow us to figure that out and then we can develop the right routines for you. And so we're super focused on that right now. Um, and it's been fascinating to learn about it. Um, and that will apply then to everyone. When you think about things like off platform, which is what I would call Netflix and Sesame Street, what, what those off-platform channels do for us is they allow us to educate millions of people. And that's literally what happens, as you can imagine, on Netflix or uh, Sesame Street or Snapchat, for that matter. Millions of people end up viewing these, and it allows us to get content out to people and help out to people who maybe didn't know anything about meditation or the benefits of meditation. Um, and we're reaching them where they already go, like a Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, and so that allows us just to increase awareness of the benefits of mindfulness. And again, whether they use us or someone else, we still take um, pride in the fact that we're helping people understand its benefits. And then in the employer space, Gosh, that's a whole new um, it, that's a whole new avenue for us because one of the things that happened with COVID was you know this increase in stress, this increase in burnout, and candidly, an increase in employees expecting that employers offer help for the mind just like they do for the body because there's so much support for physical well-being and physical ailments, but there wasn't much that was being done um, for mental wellness. And so that opened up a completely new avenue for us. Yeah. All right. I, I want to turn the attention back to you for a moment because there's just so many incredible things we can talk about Headspace, but there's so many incredible things to talk about with you and about you. And I always ask the time machine question to our guests. Okay. So if you could take a time machine back into your 20s, what advice do you give to that CC and why? You know, I kind of mentioned this a little bit ago, but if I could go back into my 20s, because as I mentioned, I finished school and literally went right smack into the workforce in, in what I had graduated in. But if I could go back, I would have said, slow down. And I would have said, go, go explore the world. There's a lot you don't know. Um, go experience people you don't know, um, because people from different backgrounds, people who have who've had different, you know, growing up experiences, people who have different points of view from, from mine, I think would have opened my eyes to things sooner. Um, 
and just taking the time to get to know yourself. Cause in your twenties, you just, you really don't know yourself as well as you could. So I would have said, don't go right into the work, go, go volunteer, go, uh, go to another country, just go do some things that really get you out of your comfort zone. And from that, discover what makes your heart beat faster. Um, and then um, do what you fall in love with. Do the thing that makes you, I, like I said, makes your heart beat faster as opposed to the thing that you think you're supposed to go do. And, uh, and it is what I, I, I uh, encourage my son to do now, which is don't worry about what you think you should do because you got a degree in that. You know, if, if your passion, for example, is around music, go do that. Yeah. You know, we have a lot of people that um, are guests on the show that may have started off as the founder of their business. We certainly have a lot of entrepreneurs that are watching, but we also have a lot of folks that, you know, like you had this incredible career where they navigated large global organizations. And to me, um, you know, so I had, I had started this company Docstock in 2007. We sold it to Intuit in, at the end of 2013. And it was such a great place. And I loved it there so much. But the truth is, CC, I really saw myself as a serial founder at that time. And I don't, I, I wanted to be keeping to build more businesses. And I don't know that I had this skill set, certainly at that time, to be exceptional, you know, as a leader in a large global organization like this. As you think about the kinds of skills and lessons that you learned that helped you keep taking on more responsibility, have, you know, bigger rewards given to you, kind of, you know, historically talk about move up the corporate ladder, you know, what are the things that you just did exceptionally well that peers that maybe started in the same place as you or were at the same spot at you at the midpoint of your career? Like, how did you, where did you just keep out excelling people around you? Um. So first of all, I would say that these might be the things I excelled at recognizing that other people excelled at other things. And, and by the way, I was just thinking about what you said about your own journey, Jason, because sometimes, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit and the founding of companies is a different energy and a different skill set on the scaling and growing large companies to be even larger. So lots of times it's a different skill set because it's a different passion. But for me, um, I'll go back first and foremost to what I would call authentic curiosity. So really seriously focused on what new things do I need to learn? What new things do I need the team to learn um, that will continue to make us stronger and stronger? And, you know, I think if you were to ask somebody at Intuit about me, that's what you would hear is, you know, she was the one that was always uh, out there trying to learn what are what are the new things that people are doing, how might that apply to us, um, and then you know constantly taking our teams through it. Which again, I just did this this morning with the team. I use the word authentic curiosity because authentic curiosity means you're willing to let go of what you know and what you believe in order to allow new information in. There's a term that we use, um, which is add the query, which is the opposite of authentic curiosity, which is when you are trying to lead through questions, but you're really giving your point of view out and disguising it as a question. Um, and so we really try to work, at least I try to work with my leaders to be authentically curious uh, and accept the fact that your beliefs might be different or might be wrong and be open to the fact that there might be uh, new information. The second one is being really clear where you're gonna spend your time and where you're not gonna spend your time. Um, this can be really difficult I've found because people may think that you feel that the work that they do isn't important and it's not, it's, it, that's not the case at all. It's just that you as a leader have to declare that I'm gonna spend my time in these areas. By the way, Brad does this really well as also, but, but I'm gonna spend my time in these areas because this will be most important to the business and most likely to move us forward. Um, and I'm not gonna spend my time on these areas because I have great leaders there who know how to do this and they don't need my input. And if they do, they'll come to me. And from that, one of the areas that I spend my time on is leadership development. And it is the area that I 
uh, personally take ownership for because I have passion for it. I enjoy doing it. And I think it is my responsibility to take an interest in them and their careers and where we can take it. And that means that I focus less on being the person who has all of the ideas in the meeting in the meeting. And instead I focus on how do I pull that from others? Yeah. I'll tell you, you very thoughtfully describe what, you know, I self-identify that I still need to get better at as a leader, you know, and so the benefit of getting to do these interviews is I get to learn a lot. Let, let me ask you, as you, you're clearly just such an exceptionally authentic, humble human being. You know what I mean? It, it's such, it's such a beautiful way you phrase that, like, let go of what, you know, you already know to let new information in. When you find yourself in a situation where you're, background and experience is telling you that, Hey, this is a, this is a path that can lead to success, but your operating principle tells you, okay, I've got to be open to new information. And your team around you is telling, you know, there's a different path. How do you reconcile those two? So um, first of all, I don't always do it well. So full disclosure, there are times when I can't help myself. Um, But, but when I am optimized, (laughs) <laughs> um, I try to do the discovery process through questions and the, you know, the kind of the questioning process I use starts very broad um, and it focuses on, are we all trying to solve the same problem? Do we have common sets of inputs that are influencing us and are we all going in the same direction? So, you know, I start with that, that grounding uh, and then when people offer up their ideas, I, I simply ask what, what gives you confidence in those? What, what kinds of experiments have you run that, that point you in that direction? Have you learned about this from something else that you've seen work? And can you give me the analog for that, you know, so that I can catch up with where you are? Um, and if I, but if I still can't help myself, I literally will just be transparent and say, let me offer up a perspective. I'm not guiding you to go in this direction. I want to be clear on that, but I do want you to hear what's on my mind. Um, and um, so I'm going to offer that to you, allow you to ask questions, but understand that I'm not giving direction. I'm simply giving you a perspective because I think, you know, one of the things that uh, really can send teams into tailwinds is if we're not clear that this is simply a question or perspective and not a direction, they take what we say as, you know, Jason said this, therefore that must be what he wants us to go do. And so I think we just have to be clear that all we're doing is saying, this is just an opinion, not a direction. Yeah. Is so to what you just brought up, where do you spend your most amount? So you talked about leadership coaching. Where else do you spend your focus today at Headspace? And what are some areas that it might be surprising to people that you don't spend time, that you consciously say, hey, I've got great leaders for this at Headspace, and so I'm not going to focus there? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I spend my time on strategy, on leadership development, and because I have passion around it, uh, technologies like AI, um, you, and I should probably say I also spend time with our enterprise clients because it's a newer area for us. And I love being able to understand what's motivating them and also to learn from them on the practices that they're implementing. Where I don't spend time would be areas like, um, you know, our, uh, our customer success team is great. They are so empathetic and so responsible, responsive to our customers that there's nothing I can do except slow them down. So I just get out of the way unless there's something that they want me to do, or let's say our IT area, meaning the the group that supports all of our infrastructure, they're more than capable and there's nothing I can offer them other than leadership development that would help them. So I'm explicit that I'm not going to get in, in your way there. Yeah. I want to go. So, uh, I have a guess that I that I might know what's at the top of your list, but you know, you talk about going over to the commercial side and marketing and sales. You know, if I were to ask you, like, what's your what's your secret of success that you would coach somebody around sales? I mean, if someone has an opportunity to be in front of a customer, right? What's 
CC's handbook for how to do sales well and what do people do really wrong and the mistakes they make in sales? Well, the first thing that anyone's going to tell you is that she brought up this SNO focus. So without a doubt, they're going to they're going to go right there to, uh, you know, tell me about the person, tell me about what they're struggling with. So they're going to go right there. Um, I will have an allergic reaction. And again, everyone knows this. If, if I see a deck or a paper that starts out with the background of headspace, they know I'll go, oh, my goodness, um, because it's not about us. It's a, totally about them. So really deep understanding of them and what makes, uh, what, what are they trying to solve? And you know what, Jason, sometimes literally I'll look at something, a situation with a customer and say, I don't think we're the best fit for them. And that's okay. Cause we want to make sure that we're literally the best fit for somebody that's going to deploy us. Cause it is a big decision when the head of HR decides to deploy a headspace, they just put you know, their reputation on the line for all of their employees. And so I want to make sure that our values are hundred percent aligned. Um, so that, that would be uh, one aspect. The second aspect would be, do you have an executive sponsor? Because, um, you know, somebody in the organization who can say not just no, but also yes, that are they aligned? Do we have similar values? Uh, can we co-create together to make a great experience for their employees? So um, I'm going to want to know, you know, who that executive sponsor is and who within the company can be helpful in engaging with that executive sponsor. Um, but those would probably be the main things that, you know, don't start the story about us, yeah. make it about them all the time. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I was able to pretty much guess what you were going to say. And it's just such <laughs> tried and true advice. You know, and you clearly do it. And every, like in every one of your interactions, you just make it about the folks around you. It's so easy to see what feels the most similar to you about Intuit and Headspace and what feels the most different and foreign. Um, purpose-driven companies, both companies are highly purpose-driven, um, you know, Intuit focused on improving people's financial lives Headspace focused on uh, health and happiness of the world, both very purpose-driven, both very, very uh, customer-centric, en enormous amounts of empathy, value-driven companies. All of that is so incredibly similar. Uh, and then this experimentation mindset, all of that is quite similar. You know, the areas that are different um, uh, are different because of the state probably of the company. So, you know, uh, Headspace was, you know, an earlier stage company, although not at all a startup, it's 10 years old and the size of it is well past startup. But, but many of the um, practices were still what you would see in a startup. So, you know, we didn't have all the operating mechanisms in place, all of the, um, you know, performance systems in place, um, the, um, tools and leadership development, some of those things were, you know, missing or kind of elementary still. So those are things that we've put in place and, and the leadership team has really embraced them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what's, I mean, what's Headspace, it already feels like such world domination in a good way. I mean, again, you talk about like your platform on Netflix we have a three and a half year old and a one and a half year old. So Sesame Street's on our house every single day. That was so magical to see, you know, what you all did there. Like it's probably one of the single best known and most downloaded consumer apps. You're now driving, you know, it as a workplace option and to the enterprise. And so many of us as employers are wanting to get it as a benefit and really something much needed for our teams. When you think of the business that you want to help create five years out from today, what does that headspace look like to you? And what are you most excited and passionate about building? Yeah, um, I think there's two avenues I'd probably highlight there. Um, I think the workplace and healthcare provider uh, channels are the biggest growth opportunities for us and the biggest opportunity for us to have an impact in people's lives because in those scenarios, it is either a paid for benefit from the payers, which, you know, needs to happen because again, we cover your physical well-being. We need to cover 
your mental well-being. And the more that we can get these types of services covered by payers or employers, I mean, just think about it, Jason, then we can reach out to so many people that couldn't get access to a solution like this on their own, either because they just didn't know about it or um, they didn't have the wherewithal to be able to pay for it. And so being able to make this something that is available to those that need it the most, super inspiring to me. The second place is our youth. You know, I made the reference to, you know, almost half of us will have a diagnosable mental health condition in our lifetime. And for half of us, that starts before the age of 14. We make Headspace free today to educators because just think of their job, but we also make it free to healthcare providers because of the work that they do. Um, what we are now working on is making it free to people who are under the age of 18. And if we can make this something that is taught and is part of the classroom, you know, you think about it's the way you, you start off the day in the classroom or what you do before or after recess. Again, when we send people out for recess, shouldn't we do something for their minds? And how we can teach students to be calmer, to be more present, to have less stress during examinations and things like that, you know, we can make a real difference in, uh, you know, I think uh, having an impact on not just the stress and anxiety of students, but reducing things like suicide that happens. And so we're working hard to make this part of a student's life, even part of um, re um, sports program. So before the soccer game, you know, there's a meditation that takes place. But if we can do that, think about having the next generations be much more balanced than the rest of us are. That would be the most fulfilling impact that I could see. And that's the piece that I'm most focused on for the company. Yeah. I know we just have a little bit more time here with you and thank you for being so generous today, CC. Uh, I know you've got, I think it's something like 2000 companies that you work with at Headspace, right? And so like, just talk to us about how you help those leaders implement mental health. And obviously now we are transitioning into a completely new work paradigm where we're trying to figure out what's going to be the right balance at work. Is it hybrid? Are we going to go back to full times? I think a lot of folks are like, look, I don't want to go back to the way it was before. How do you think about headspace leading in those areas? You know, um, so set aside making the app available. One of the things that we do is we come with the program. So we help them with what to launch, you know, each and every month and what the leader's role is in that process. And I'm not saying that we have all the answers by any stretch, but, but we do try to bring some of the things that we've tried at Headspace that we've found to be effective. And I'll mention a couple of those. Um, so we have twice during the day where there's a time for no meeting scheduling and, you know, you can to choose to join a headspace, uh, guided meditation with, you know, all of us, or you can choose to take a walk and do your own thing. That's totally up to you, but at least twice during the day, uh, you can't schedule meetings. We kick off our all hands leadership development meetings with a, a meditation so that we're all doing it together. And I'm mentioning this because these are the same things that we recommend to our employers. Um, we will talk in our own all, our all hands about areas that we're personally struggling and what we're doing about it or a family member or a friend, what they're going through and how we're trying to help them with it. We encourage that when we launch within an enterprise that we have the CEO talk about what are they doing to take care of their mind? What have been their struggles? Um, what's working for them? We encourage them to freely and transparently talk about it. For us, we've also got um, every other Friday is a mind day, which just means you have things you need to take care of to keep your mind intact, so go do that but you're not, you're not working at Headspace today. And then the alternative Friday is a no meeting day. And so we share those ideas with our enterprises because for us, it has actually helped us with employee uh, morale, employee energy. We've seen no impact in terms of productivity. In fact, we've actually seen it go up. And so those are, you know, think about those as experiments that we've run that we then share with um 
our uh, enterprise clients as well. As we start to think about the hybrid work environment, you know, we're actually partnering with several large organizations and ourselves to talk about what is that future of work going to look like and what are the best practices going to be? Because if you think about what we did, this is my opinion of what we did in 2020, we adjusted by applying technology to doing work the same way. We didn't really develop a lot of new routines. And so we're now focused on what are the new routines and technology helps us with that, but what are those new routines? And I'll, like an, I'll, I'll quickly share the story of Microsoft because Microsoft reached out to us and wanted to put our content into Microsoft Teams. And that's to me brilliant because that starts to think about new routines. And now think about being able to apply AI and saying, hey, Jason, you've been on Teams or Zoom or whatever you use for three hours. Uh, this would be a time for you to take some, do some breathing exercises. Or I notice in your calendar, you have an interview coming up. This would be a good time to do some breathing to get yourself present and ready for that, um, for that interview. And so now we're starting to think about how do we incorporate this into technology to develop new routines, which I think is absolutely the way we need to think about the future of work. Yeah. You know, there's not a lot of businesses genuinely CC that I'm jealous of, meaning that I wish I could be a part of it or that I had a product that was just that resonating with its customers. And I'll tell you, Headspace is very much at the top of that list. They are so unbelievably lucky to have you here as their CEO now. It was already such a great company. You know, I had heard about you over the years and um, I'm remiss we didn't get to cross paths it into it, but you're just one of the most humble, thoughtful really brilliant, amazing communicators that we've had a chance to meet here. And um, I'm excited to see all the amazing places Headspace is going to go. Thank you so much for taking so much time out of the day. I know you got a lot of things going on there in the background, but thank you. So for sorry. <laughs> oh, of course you got, you got those, those little dogs that you got to help get taken care of. And thank you for spending so much time here with so many of us and sharing these lessons. I think honestly, even just you know, the I versus the O, it's so meaningful. It's so impactful in everything we do. And how you talk about being a simple and straightforward communicator. And there's so many of us that were already rooting headspace on, and they're going to be doing that even more now, knowing that, you know, you're leading that company. And so we're, we're all excited to see where headspace is going to go. And thank you so much for your time today. Jason, you are uh, very kind. So I appreciate all the wonderful words that you've said about uh, the company and very kind words about myself. Um, the work that you're doing here, bringing insights to so many of us so that we can learn from others um, is wonderful. So I, I cheer you on enthusiastically. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone that's uh, continuing to join us for these series. We're gonna keep having amazing guests like Cece here with us and so, um, please, keep, please keep giving us your recommendations uh, and we're going to keep doing what we can to share incredible leadership lessons and if I knew then conversations with amazing folks like CC. Have a great day, everyone. And thank you again so much. Bye.